I know that you also have a strong attachment to Israel, and indeed, I remember discussing it with you at the time, in 2013, you decided to take Israeli citizenship as a kind of uh, political and cultural act as much as anything else, because you weren't going to live there at the time. So tell me when and you, you, of course, uh, write a lot about Israel, uh, being one of your subscribers, I greatly enjoy uh, reading what you send around. Uh, maybe enjoy is not exactly the right word because this reading for most part is not enjoyable, but I find it uh, very important. You give lots of uh, valuable information. Let me, uh, however, make one thing clear. Of course, uh, uh, the fact that I am a Jew uh, uh, plays a very important part in my attachment uh, to Israel and in my support of it. But here is another point. You see, I grew up in the Soviet Union, in the evil empire, where anti-Zionist propaganda was an integral part of the official state propaganda. And all of us, uh, doesn't matter Jews or non-Jews, who were living there, but were not brainwashed by the official state propaganda, for all of us, it was always clear as a day uh, an axiom, an obvious axiom, which uh, required no explanation. Israel is good. Israel's cause is right. Anti-Zionism, anti-Zionist propaganda is bullshit. Uh, the leading Soviet dissidents, Andrei Sakharov, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Vladimir Bukovsky, they were all staunch supporters of Israel, even though uh, they didn't have a single drop of Jewish blood. And the leading Czech, Czechoslovak dissident, Václav Havel, who later became uh, uh, president. a president of the Czech Republic, he was all, also a staunch supporter of Israel. You know, I was with Havel when he, you know, when he became pre the, 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 in Prague, there was the Velvet Revolution that overthrew communism in November 1989. Okay. Václav Havel, who helped, who had come out of prison and house arrest and helped lead that revolution, won, uh, five weeks later, on January 1st, 1990, he became president of what was then Czechoslovakia. Okay. And his very first act, his very first act, domestic or foreign, was to recognize the state of Israel. And he did so without consulting the foreign ministry, the Czech foreign ministry, where at that time it was full of communist uh, officials that were still loyal to Moscow because they hadn't yet changed the personnel. So I think that in Eastern Europe in particular, there's an understanding that anti-Zionism is connected to kind of anti-democracy, anti-Semitism and other things. Just taking it out of my mouth. I, I myself was going to mention the Eastern Europe in general. Eastern European countries are pro-Israel, precisely because they suffered under communism and they know full well what anti-Zionism is worth. Now, uh, it is uh, 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 a great irony, but it goes back to the time of the Cold War. Back then, uh, many Western leftists who considered themselves to be progressive were supporting communism, which was one of the most reactionary mm -hmm. systems in the world. Uh, they supported the Soviet Union uh, where gays were being imprisoned, those so-called progressives. Yes. 
Some of those same people support the Islamic Republic of Iran, where gays are not only being imprisoned, they're being executed for being gay, and yet leftist intellectuals, the same ones that want to wipe out Israel, spend their whole time saying nice things about Iran, just as their fathers said nice things about the Soviet Union and Stalin. Uh, and nowadays, many leftists on the West are uh, against Israel. They support Israel's enemies who are reactionaries. And these leftists consider themselves to be progressive. By the way, speaking of uh, homophobia, Tel Aviv is the most popular destination for gays in the whole world. Mm -hmm. I know. Uh, and another important, uh, another interesting thing. Uh, these leftists believe that uh, uh, Zionism was wrong in the first place because uh, Palestine um, was an Arab land uh, and uh, the Palestinian Arabs naturally were against uh, uh, establishing a Jewish state there. Now, at the same time, uh, an integral part of the left-wing ideology is the belief that uh, money should be taken away from the rich and given to the poor. The left believe uh, in progressive taxation, in very high taxes for the rich, uh, so, uh, in order to give money to those who don't have enough. Now, let's go back to the beginning of the Zionist movement. The Arabs had the entire Northern Africa, the whole Arabian Peninsula, Palestine, Syria, and Iraq. The Jews had nothing. Now, according to the left-wing moral, was it not fair to take at least part of Palestine away from the Arabs who had so much and give it to the Jews who had nothing? Well, sorry to correct you, it wasn't actually in the hands of the Arabs, it was in the hands of the Turks who were occupiers and then the British and Jews. Yes, uh, yes. no, it was not in the hands of the Arabs. Uh, uh, the Arabs were living there. Sure, and they're still living there, which is fine. But anyway, I think that uh, it's interesting because a lot of leftists seem to think that um, it's not about being for Israel and against the Palestinians. The left are actually against both Israeli Jews and against Palestinian Arabs because their policies and their extremism prevents reconciliation and peace and a better environment. Well, in the same way as uh, 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 during the Cold War, those leftists who were supporting communism were in fact against the Russian people and all the other peoples who were suffering under communism. Sure, and, and you know, it was, uh, look, I was at school, even at high school, and I went to a good school. I remember my deputy headmaster saying that uh, people were happy to live under communism. It was also the time of Mrs. Thatcher in England, and one of the teachers said, well, at least the health care is much better in Ceausescu's Romania, which is just patent nonsense, I mean, better than England. People were, you know, children were virtually starving to death in, in Ceausescu's Romania. It is pure communist propaganda, and until today, people in the West, too many of them, have not acknowledged their kind of I would say collaboration of, of many writers and, and intellectuals with this communist regime, which may be... Also, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, too many Western politicians, which was a surprise and uh, 
a shock for me that I was not aware of when I was living in the Soviet Union. And that's why for many years I could not understand um, the, uh, the widespread anti-Israel sentiment uh, in the West. Why many Western politicians were going out of their way to uh, force Israel to make concessions to her enemies when life was demonstrating time and again that those concessions were only encouraging terrorism. And then, and then I read one book which became a revelation for me. It was written by someone who I mentioned a few minutes ago, one of the leading Soviet dissidents, Vladimir Bukovsky, who sadly died a few months ago. In early 1992, he was able to gain access to secret Soviet archives. He managed to make copies of many important documents from those archives. And then he wrote a book in which he published uh, a great uh, many of those documents. The book was called Judgment in Moscow. It was published in Russia, uh, in Russian, in French, in German, in a number of Eastern European languages, but it was not published in English until very recently. Uh, Bukowski offered it to a uh, prominent American publishing company, but they demanded that Bukowski uh, uh, make some changes so that it would be more uh, left wing. Of course, Bukowski refused. And only recently, this book was published. I have it right here. Here it is. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend it to everybody to whom liberty and truth are dear and important. Look, judgment in Moscow, Soviet crimes, and Western complicity. I think Western complicity... I knew about uh, the Soviet crimes almost since I was a teenager. But for many years, I was not aware about the extent of the Western complicity. So it's a crime in itself. I mean, look... I'm... And that's why when uh, communism collapsed, uh, and Bukowski went to Yeltsin's people and started explaining to them that it was uh, of utmost importance to open the archive. They all agreed, but Yeltsin, an ex-high-ranking uh, official of the Communist Party, was against, and also the U.S. State Department was against opening the Soviet secret archives. This book makes it perfectly clear why. Now, I mean, for me, I also agree that the attitudes that are too prevalent among the kind of ruling elite, elites in America, Britain, France, Canada, and elsewhere, these elites, Everywhere. you know, the elites are dom these leftist elites are dominant in the State Department, in the media like the New York Times, BBC, in uh, academia and so on, my professors, it was, it was really propaganda and people have been brainwashed. And it's the same brainwashing that has been um, worked against the ordinary people of Russia. They're now doing it against the ordinary people of Israel and the Palestinians who also want peace, They're just like ordinary Russians were the victims. They are in, a, in effect siding with governments like 
the government of Abbas, the Palestinian Authority, or Hamas, or Iran. And they are, the, they are very smug, but actually there is, in my mind, a direct connection to these attitudes um, towards the Soviet regime and the attitudes towards dictatorships like Iran and the Palestinian Authority and others. Let me tell you one story. I have a, an Iranian friend who lives in Western Europe. Uh, her parents live in Tehran, and of course she is uh, in touch with them all the time by email. A few, a few years ago, uh, when uh, there were elections in Israel, uh, and I met my friend, she said to me, my father asked me to tell you that he is delighted that Netanyahu had won. Sure, Netanyahu is much more popular among Arabs and Iranians than he is among Western leftists, no question. Um, people don't believe me. I go to a lot of back channel meetings with people from the, throughout the Arab world, and they have good things to say about Israel, they have good things to say about Benjamin Netanyahu. You try saying the same things in a polite society in London or Manhattan or Paris, and they will be expelled from their company probably forevermore. And they are very close-minded, I'm afraid. The close-mindedness is in the West. Not, that's the real problem. During the first war in Lebanon in early 1980s, uh, the Soviet pianist, Laser Berman, mm -hmm. had a photograph of Ariel Sharon on his grand piano in Moscow. I know that from his son, Pavel, who I'm friends with. Tell me something, how just, we haven't got much time left, but just with Russia today, have you got any thoughts? I mean, you left Russia already in 1991, so it's 19 years ago. I know you visit whenever you can, when time allows. Years ago. Sorry? Almost 30 years ago. Uh, sorry, almost third, exactly, sorry, 29 years ago. But um, look, Russia, okay, it's no longer a Soviet uh, Union, it's no longer a communist dictatorship, but it hasn't evolved into the, you know, country that many of us would have hoped it would no, have done. Not, not at all. Uh, unfortunately, uh, things went wrong from the very beginning, and how could they... Uh, not go wrong, we realize now when uh, uh, the new so-called democratic uh, Russia was run by an ex-high-ranking official of the Communist Party. The KGB even. You no, mean afterwards. Yeah. Uh, I mean Yeltsin. Yeltsin and then... So, uh, and so uh, his politics uh, was such that uh, many Russians became very disappointed by the Western ideals of liberty and democracy because uh, uh, the politics of uh, 1990s discredited those ideas in the eyes of many ordinary Russians. And then uh, an ex-KGB colonel came to power and still runs the country. And keeps on changing the constitution to make sure he's going to exactly. try to continue running it. 